All right, everyone, it is six o'clock my time. So it is time to start our final course, uh, which is crazy. It has been a good semester and uh, a fast one. So here is what we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to do our traditional review. We're going to talk about discrimination training, prompting, prompt fading and transfer, and then review um, some of the test information. And then we'll call it a wrap. Okay, so ASR number one, the seven dimensions of ABA include applied, behavioral, analytic, technological, conceptually systematic, effective, and what? A, functional, B, psychological, C, generality, D, hypothetical. And the correct answer here is C, generality. ASR number two, one way to remember the seven dimensions is A, B, or C. And the correct answer here is C. ASR number three, the dimension of behavioral includes A, observable and measurable responses, B, precise definitions that describe behavior and not an outcome, C, document that the participant behavior has changed, D, all of the above, or E, A and B. And the correct answer could be construed as D or E. You could make the argument that C could potentially fall under a different dimension, but D would also be acceptable. ASR number four, applied refers to A, social significance, B, doing things, C, observable and measurable, or D, repeatability. And the correct answer here is A, social significance. ASR number five, technological refers to A, socially significant, B, doing things, C, observable and measurable, or D, repeatability. And the correct answer here is D, repeatability. ASR number six, conceptually systematic refers to A, interventions that come from behavior analysis, B, enables consumers to derive similar procedures, C, assists in integrating a system and not a collection of tips, or D, all of the above. And the correct answer here is D, all of the above. ASR number seven, analytic refers to A, social significance, B, precision, C, functional relation, or D, hypothesis.
And the correct answer here is C, functional relation. ASR number eight, generality refers to A, durable, B, changes that last over time, C, appear in multiple environments, D, spread to other behaviors, or E, all of the above. And the answer here would be E, all of the above. And for those that may have selected something different, uh, maintenance typically falls under generality, which would cover durable and changes that last over time. ASR number nine, effective refers to A, did this work? B, produces practical results? C, must reach clinical or social significance? D, noticeable change? Or E, all of the above? And the correct answer here, <clears throat> pardon me, and the correct answer here is E, all of the above. ASR number 10, refrigerator mothers cause autism, true or false? And the answer here, of course, is false. ASR number 11, school district staff can diagnose a student with ASD, true or false? And the correct answer here is false. ASR number 12, learners who receive 25 to 40 hours of one-on-one -on -one treatment are receiving what type of treatment? A, focused, B, comprehensive, C, paraprofessional, or D, discreet? And the answer here is B, comprehensive. ASR number 13, the general philosophy of ABA treatment include what? A, everyone with autism is capable of learning. B, right to effective treatment. C, the learner is always right. D, self-determination. E, least intrusive uh, treatment. Or F, all of the above. And the correct answer here is F, all of the above. Target behaviors should be selected for the primary benefit of others to simply maintain the status quo or because they pique the interest of someone in a position to change the behavior, true or false. And the correct answer here is false. ASR number 15, a good operational definition should be able to pass the what? Eyeball test, dead man's test, stranger test, or standardized test.
And the correct answer here is C, stranger test. We would only be using the dead man's test if we were talking about, is this considered a behavior or not? ASR number 16, the three fundamental properties or dimensional quantities are A, repeatability, temporal extent, and temporal locus, B, IRT, latency, and duration, C, count, frequency, and acceleration. And the correct answer here is A, repeatability, temporal extent, and temporal locus. ASR number 17, social negative reinforcement is also known as A, attention, B, tangible, or C, escape. And the correct answer here is C, escape. ASR number 18, automatic positive reinforcement depends on the action of others, true or false. And the correct answer here is false. ASR number 19, Social positive reinforcement is also known as A, attention, B, tangible, C, escape. And the correct answer here is A, attention. ASR number 20, a discriminative stimulus signals the store is open for what? A, punishment, B, reinforcement, or C, extinction. And the correct answer here is B, reinforcement. ASR number 21, FBA interventions can consist of at least blank strategic approaches, A6, B3, C2, D9. And the correct answer here is B, three. ASR number 22. There are blank main functions of behavior tested for using an FA. A2, B7, C3, D4. And the correct answer here is D4. This graph suggests the function of behavior is A, alone, B, attention, C, escape. And the correct answer here is C, escape. ASR number 24, this graph suggests the function of behavior is A, alone, B, attention, or C, escape.
And the correct answer here is B, attention. This graph suggests the function of behavior is A, alone, B, attention, or C, escape. And the correct answer here is A, alone. ASR number 26. There are how many basic schedules of reinforcement? A3, B6, C4, D5. And the correct answer here is four. ASR number 27. The same amount of time elapses when reinforcement is delivered is called what? A, variable ratio, B, fixed interval, C, variable interval, or D, fixed ratio. And the correct answer here is B, fixed interval. ASR number 28, the same amount of reinforcement is delivered based on a number of responses is called what? A, variable ratio, B, fixed interval, C, variable interval, or D, fixed ratio. And the correct answer here is D, fixed ratio. ASR number 29, reinforcement delivered based on an average of unit of time is called what? A, variable ratio, B, fixed interval, C, variable interval, or D, fixed ratio. And the correct answer here is C, variable interval. ASR number 30, reinforcement delivered on an average number of responses is called what? A, variable ratio, B, fixed interval, C, variable interval, or D, fixed ratio. And the correct answer here is A, variable ratio. ASR number 31, the theory that reinforcement must be worth the effort is called what? A, stranger test, B, dead man's test, C, matching law, or D, Newton's law. And the correct answer here is C. ASR number 32, 
this procedure is among the most well-researched and well-known treatment for or and education procedure for teaching skills to learners with ASD. A, Socratic seminar, B, discrete trial training, C, constructivism, or D, direct instruction. And the correct answer here is B, discrete trial training. ASR number 33, the process and product of reducing a complex behavior and sequences of behavior to their component elements is called what? A, shaping, B, backward chaining, C, task analysis, or D, forward chaining. The correct answer here is C, task analysis. ASR number 34, the component parts of a task resulting from a task analysis that resemble the terminal behavior along some meaningful dimension that, when properly sequenced, lead to exhibition of the terminal behavior. Is it A, task analysis, B, successive approximations, C, scaffolding, or D, chunking? And the correct answer here is B, successive approximations. All right, nice work. Our review got dense, like I had told you at the beginning. We got to quite, I think, 30, how many was it? 34. So here's our first lecture verification. Um, uh, our first lecture verification. By reinforcing a series of successive approximations, we bring a rare response to a very high probability in a short time. So that is lecture verification number one. By reinforcing a series of successive approximations, we bring a rare response to a very high probability in a short time. Brought to you by The Dude. I'll give you a moment to write that down. All right, so let's jump into discrimination training, prompting, prompt baiting, and transfer. So what we need to think about when we're talking about this topic is the antecedent, which is the stimulus event that precedes an, precedes an operant response. Discrimination occurs when a response occurs more frequently in the presence of one stimulus than in the presence of another usually as a result of discrimination discrimination training procedures. Uh, stimulus control, the behavioral principle around this or events consistently present are present when a behavior is reinforced and become cues that set the occasion for the behavior. Further, discrimination occurs when a specific behavior follows a relevant cue and generalization occurs when an irrelevant cue produces the same behavior. And here is an example of that if we're looking at our three-term contingency. If we are looking at an ABC, so we have A, our antecedent condition, you are not talking to anyone. The behavior is you picking up the phone. 
The stimulus would be the phone ringing or the phone being silent on this bottom end of our contingency. We follow the top line of the contingency. So you're not talking to anyone. The phone rings, so there's a stimulus. We pick up the phone and you talk to someone. We have A, B, and C, and if talking to someone is reinforcing for you, the next time that the phone rings, you will pick up the phone. We have our condition here on, or our contingency here on the bottom line, and it starts off with the antecedent. You're not talking to anyone. The phone doesn't ring, but you pick up the behavior. The consequence of that is that you are not talking to anyone. There's no one on the other end. So the next opportunity when the phone doesn't ring, you're not going to pick up the phone. If we go back and look at this example, something I want to mention too is the stimulus is also not only an audible stimulus, but we have a visual stimulus. We can see, uh, we can see the phone, but then the phone rings and that is what we have to discriminate between if we're going to engage in phone picking up behavior. Um, another ed example of that is if we look at this uh, guacamole example. So your friends are mildly complimentary of your cooking skills. You have hard avocados, you make guacamole, your friends deride your cooking skills. The next time that you have Hard avocados, you won't make guacamole because it doesn't make good guacamole. If we look at the bottom or the lower part of this contingency here, again, your uh, friends are mildly complimentary of your cooking skills. You have soft avocados, so you make guacamole. Your friends are stoked on your guacamole. So the next time you have soft avocados, you'll make guacamole. And we can see the discrimination here. So when a response occurs more frequently in the presence of one stimulus than in the presence of another, another, you, it's usually a result of a discrimination training procedure. I have to apologize for the pauses. I have terrible allergies today, so I do apologize. So if we're talking about discrimination training procedures, we have a discriminative stimulus. If we're looking at a, uh, teacher student or learner therapist example we have the teacher or therapist asking a question the operant response would be to answer a question and positive reinforcement the teacher smiles and praises and that is how the uh, discrimination training goes and the reinforcement strengthens that behavior We've talked about discriminative stimuli, uh, the stimulus that sets the occasion for the behavior, signals that the store is open for reinforcement. We also need to remember what, the, what an S delta is. So a stimulus in the presence of which a particular response will not be reinforced. Uh, an antecedent that does not serve as an appropriate cue for the behavior. So if we think back to the guacamole example, and if we're, the S delta in that instance would be the avocados that are not ripe, that are hard. Here we see another example. This is an animal example. So we're looking at bird behavior. The antecedent here would be that there's no corn available to the bird. The discriminative stimulus for the bird would be the bird seeds a target. When the bird sees a target, it pulls a string and corn is delivered as a reinforcement for the bird engaging in the string pulling behavior when it sees the target. Looking at the lower contingency, still the antecedent is no corn. The bird sees a man or woman or person, which would be an else delta. If the bird engages in, uh, or Sorry, the bird wouldn't even engage in the string pulling behavior because it has learned over trials to discriminate uh, when to engage in behaviors. So when a bird sees a person, 
that is an S delta to the bird. It does not engage in the behavior because no reinforcement is available. The store is closed for reinforcement and no corn is delivered. Here we're looking at that original example here. Sorry about the double here. I don't know why it came in twice. Oh, that's why. So here we are. Okay, this is what I wanted to get to. I apologize for the double slides. Here's another example we're looking at, in this instance, the distributed stimulus and stimulus delta. So you're comfortable as you are. That's kind of antecedent. It's you existing. It's you and your environment. Um, everything is going well. The behavior is you put on your heavy coat before going outside. Consequence, you are comfortable or consequence, you are not comfortable. So if we look at uh, the SD for putting on your heavy coat, the weather channel says it's going to be five degrees. If we are comfortable and if we're about to go outside, <clears throat> and we see that the weather says it's going to be five degrees, that is an S delta for us to put on our winter coat to be comfortable uh, when we go outside or at least attempt to try to remain comfortable. Now, if we are comfortable, we see the weather channel uh, say it's going to be 85 degrees and we still put on our heavy coat to go outside, we're not going to be comfortable. The weather channel is stating that it's going to be 85 degrees is the S delta in this instance. So I'll put it up to you all for this example. Which one is the SD and which is the S delta for switching channels? So our antecedent is you had no enjoyment. Behavior, you switch channels on the stereo, uh, on your radio, on your internet radio, whatever <laughs> device you're using to listen to music on. Uh, Consequences, you have no enjoyment. Consequence here, you have enjoyment. Um, so, which do you believe is the S delta and S or discriminative stimulus? Is you hear your favorite music, the S delta or the discriminative stimulus? All right, so if you think about this, okay, so the S delta would be you hear your favorite music, right? Because if we hear, if we're listening to our favorite music, we wouldn't switch chain stations, right? And we'd continue to have enjoyment. We wouldn't even have to engage in uh, behavior of changing the chain or the station. Uh, the discriminative stimulus in this instance is you hear music you do not like. And when you hear the music you don't like, that would signal, hey, I want to change this song because it's terrible and I want to listen to something that's not terrible so I can have some enjoyment. So let's have a look at you all doing one. We're just gonna kind of look through this and work through it together. Uh, when driving a car, you stop when the light is red. So what is the behavior? It is the car stopping behavior, putting foot on, taking foot off gas, putting foot on brake, pushing foot, pushing brake pedal down. What is the antecedent condition of the behavior? What is the antecedent to the stopping um, behavior? Let's see the red light. What is the discriminative stimulus for the behavior? Actually, let me back up. So what is the antecedent before? So I think we got a little bit 
ahead of myself. I got a little bit ahead of myself. So backing up to the behavior, it is you stopping. The antecedent is driving. It is your driving behaviors. The discriminative stimulus for the stopping behavior is what? Is the red light. What would be a stimulus delta for the behavior? What would be a S delta for stopping? It would be the green light. And potentially, depending on the state that you live in, the yellow light. When I lived in Utah, there was a thing called the Utah yellow, and it just meant hammer down if it's yellow. That's, it's still green, essentially. What is the postcedent or consequence condition for the behavior when the SD is present? So the S, uh, I'm sorry, the post-scene or consequence condition for this would be uh, you're safe, you're stopped, no accident, no ticket, um, things like that. What may be a post-scene condition for the behavior in the presence of an S delta? So what might be the consequence condition of the behavior in the presence of an S delta? So if you, so in, in other words, if you stop, right, if you still engage in stopping behavior, but an S delta is present, what would occur? What would be the consequence of that? You might have angry drivers honking the horn at you, crashing, um, you could be injured severely. There'll be a lot of um, consequences that might not be very pleasant. So if we look here, we put this, these questions, right? These prompts in to our contingency. We have the S, uh, discriminative stimulus on the top, the F delta on the bottom. This car is moving forward. The light is red. We do, we engage in car stopping behaviors and the car stops moving forward. S delta example, car is moving forward. We see a green light. We still engage in the behavior of stopping a car, car stops moving and is rear-ended. So steps in developing stimulus control through discrimination training. When the discriminative stimulus is present and the target behavior is exhibited, administer reinforcement. When an S-delta is present or any other antecedent where the behavior would not be appropriate and the target behavior is exhibited, do not administer reinforcement, withhold reinforcement essentially putting that behavior on extinction by withholding reinforcement. Uh, it's important to remember it is the consequence um, or posting to the behavior that affect whether or not the behavior is repeated in the future. And I'm not sure how many of you have heard of chicken camp. Um, I have yet to go to chicken camp, but this is uh, something that is on my ABA bucket list. I want to go to chicken camp. There's a couple different chicken camps now throughout the country and it is my, it is on the bucket list for me to go to chicken camp and train chickens. I want to do this uh, very, very badly just because it looks like a blast. I'm going to show you, I think it's close to a 10 minute video on chicken camp. It's a cool video. I think it's, I think this is a longer one. Um, and they're engaging in discrimination training with this chicken. And there are several really cool videos of chicken camp on YouTube or whatever other platforms are out there. Um, but uh, and it's pretty cool. So we're going to watch this video on chicken camp.
Okay, so that is chicken cam. So here's some different, uh, so if we look at, so essentially what they're doing is engaging in discrimination training with the chickens and, and at chicken camp, teaching them to peck different lights, different, um, there's another one I don't, I might've missed it when I was typing in the chat. I don't know if I saw it in the video. Um, where they teach chickens to select different colored discs as well. So uh, chicken camp looks cool. I really want to go. Um, but if we look at a, an example of this, with a, we could have a bird or whatever it might be. Um, our contingency on the top would be no food pellet is available. A red light is flashed. The bird pecks a specific key. Bird receives a food pellet. Next time the bird sees a red light, the uh, bird will peck that specific key. That would be the contingency that would get the bird reinforcement. If we look on the bottom, no, no food pellet is available. Green light or any color that is not red. The bird pecks a specific key. No food pellet or reinforcer is delivered. Outcome, in this instance, pigeon training, pigeon learns to discriminate when to peck specific keys to receive food pellets. Here's an example with um, with a human, with a person. Uh, at the top here, we have no smile. We have the behavior of saying cat. We have the reinforcer, if we're making the assumption that a smile, which is a physical gesture by someone else, is reinforcing for the individual. Um, but here we would say, no smile, we're teaching an individual to say the word cat. And the individual would see the letter C, A, and T. The learner would say cat, teacher smiles, therapist smiles. Um, the next time this contingency is in place, if smiling is reinforcing for the student, the saying of cat behavior would continue. If we look at our bottom contingency, we have again, the antecedent is no smile. The letters D-O-G are there, but the student is, or the discriminative stimulus being trained is reading letters C-A-T as a word. And the learner says cat, we will provide no smile, we'll withhold a smile. Outcome, student learns to discriminate when to say cat in order to receive a smile. Um, here's an example of stimulus control for a punished behavior. So the antecedent would be there's no pain in mouth. The behavior is takes a bite of hot food. The food is very hot. The consequence of that is pain in the mouth. You burn your mouth from eating the hot food. The next time you have very hot food, you would not take a bite of the hot food until it cooled down a little bit. So now we also want to talk about prompting. Um, a prompt is an added stimulus that increases the probability that the SD will occasion the desired behavior. Prompts are not discriminative stimuli. That's a common um, error. Prompts should be used only when the, discri the natural discriminative stimulus has failed. So an objective is when a learner sees a flashcard with the word cat on it, the learner will say the word cat just as we had looked at um, a minute ago. So again, no smile from teacher. The flashcard says C-A-T and there's also a prompt. So what occurs is in this scenario is the natural SD does not, does not evoke the behavior that we want to occur. So then the teacher adds a verbal prompt. Teacher says cat, learner says cat. And then the reinforcer is delivered. The next time there's a cat flashcard, individual says cat. A lot of animal stuff today. 
Um, so we've all crossed the street with a signal telling us when we can begin to walk. Although pedestrians have right away, drivers of turning vehicles are often preoccupied and fail to see pedestrians, um, resulting in serious injuries um, because of the driver's behaviors. If you're in, if you've been to any major city, uh, busy college campuses, uh, grocery store parking lots, the parking lot at Target, um, you know that sometimes it is just like um, dangerous. <laughs> essentially, um, drivers just are engaging in poor driving behaviors, and um, you know people can get hurt pretty badly uh, because of poor driving behaviors. So researchers found about 30% of people only looked one way for turning vehicles when crossing the street. Uh, but I can tell you from going on walks with my two and a half year old, uh, one of the, we're teaching her right now together, uh, my wife will have her hand on one side, I'll have her hand on the other side, and we look up and down the road. We ask her if there's any cars coming. She says yes or no, we look again, we double check to make sure she's correct, um, and then we proceed. So what these researchers did is they took um, advantage of one of those first rules that you teach kids about traffic safety, um, and how we could use, or how they, rather, how they could use um, that behavior of looking back and forth, how would, we pro how would they prompt that? So using the left to right response that individuals are taught early on as kids, the researchers prompted people by adding a pair of animated eyes that look left and right just above the walking figure on the signal. And it resulted in it, and the results were that it was an effective prompt because it reminded people to look left and right before prompting. So uh, even though it was the driver, it's typically driver behavior because pedestrians have right away, the idea in this project or this uh, study was to work on pedestrian behavior to help them um, engage in more safe road crossing behaviors. <clears throat> so when we're thinking about prompting, there is a hierarchy for prompting. You have most to least and least to most. Um, you can either go from most, which would be full physical prompting, all the way to the least, which is a natural cue, or you can go the other way uh, down the hierarchy from natural cue to full physical. And we'll look at this a little bit in more, in a little bit more detail. Uh, so again, here's a different way of looking at this type, the types of prompts and levels of intrusiveness. We have the natural cue, which would be an environmental scenario, um, what you would naturally naturally uh, come into contact with. And it is the minimal or uh, least intensive level of prompt. Then we have gestural, which could be physical or audio, which is a low level of uh, prompt, verbal, instructions and roles, moderately low level of intrusiveness, visual pictures, checklists, symbols, gestures, moderately high level of prompt intrusiveness, modeling, higher level, and then full physical, uh, partial or full, um, would be the most intensive level of prompts. And that is where you're physically assisting or helping an individual go through the behavior by putting, um, by guiding them physically or partially, fully or partially. Gesture prompts are any body movement of one person that leads to the correct behavior in the presence of a discriminative stimulus of someone else. The prompter does not demonstrate the entire behavior. We're not modeling the behavior, we're just providing a gestural prompt. Um, could be a, po a, a point or something like that. If you're pointing at something. Uh, modeling prompt demonstrations of the desired behavior by one person, the model, that leads to the correct behavior in the presence of the discriminative stimulus of another person. Uh, the model is complete replication of what the observer is to do. Um, when we're thinking about modeling, we have to make sure that we have taught imitation behaviors to the learner. We also have to consider when doing learners, if uh, I'm sorry, when doing modeling, if we are not being the model, if we're having someone else be the model for our learners, we have to train that individual uh, so that they know, so we know that they can do whatever it is, whatever task or skill it is, 
to mastery. They do it correct all the time. And we have to teach them how to teach and model the behavior. So there's a little bit more work on our end if we are teaching someone else to be the model. Uh, the reason we would typically have someone else be the model is sometimes uh, the best model is someone who is a same age peer as the learner or as someone that is familiar to that person. Uh, we can definitely be models as BCBAs, BCABAs, RBTs, but sometimes if that's failing, we might think about doing some type of peer modeling strategy. There's physical prompting, so physical guidance, physically assisting or putting someone through the behavior in the presence of a discriminative stimulus used after other forms of prompt have failed. Typically, we'll want, we want to go from that, that hierarchy, we want to go least to most. Then we need to transfer stimulus control by using prompt fading, and that's where we're gradually eliminating response, response prompts. Um, you can do this through decreasing assistance or fading in, because you can also fade in, in by increasing assistance. Uh, and then prompt delay, delay presentation of the prompt after the discriminative stimulus is presented. And you can do this in a couple different ways. So we're gonna see a couple examples of this. It is a progressive time delay and a constant time delay. Prompt fading, so the response prompt is gradually removed across learning trials or reduced over time. And again, there's the two types, decreasing and increasing, depending. So if you're going most to least prompting, we would be just decreasing the prompts. If we're going um, least to most, we would, be, we would be increasing the prompts. So if we're decreasing assistance using most to least prompting, we begin with the most intrusive prompt necessary and gradually reduce assistance. Now, just because we're starting at the most um, intrusive level doesn't necessarily we're starting at doesn't mean we're starting at full physical we might be starting at modeling it just depends what the learner needs and then we would gradually reduce levels of physical if we started at physical we would re gradually reduce levels of physical guidance uh, concurrent with learner improvement using graduated guidance if we're going least to most, we begin with the least intrusive prompts and then gradually add more intrusive prompts, but only if necessary and only if needed. If we have learners engaging in the behaviors we, that are desired um, or the skills that we would like for, you know, that are needed to be engaged in and it's working with the natural SD, then right on. Let's keep on keeping on. Um, as learners improve, fade numbers and or uh, type of prompt working back through the hierarchy. So if we are fading in, right, if we're putting more, if we're increasing assistance, when we, once we get the individual to mastery, depend, regardless of where we get to on the hierarchy, then we also, once we get to that point, then we have to fade back out and get, uh, and then decrease that assistance. And here's an example of most to least prompting.
text modeling? Okay. Gestural prompt, do you want me to just um, do like an initial gesture or should it be kind of gesturing throughout, like to point to the soap, point to the paper towel? Throughout? Okay. So that was a video of most to least prompting um, for washing hands. Now let's have a look at least to most.
Megan, turn on water. Turn on water. Now you. Paper towel. Okay, and that is least to most. Um, so something else we want to look at is prompt delay, which is the delayed presentation of, of the prompt after the SD is presented. <clears throat> the form of prompt remains the same. The thing that changes is the time between the prompt and the presentation and the prompt. There are two ways to do, to do this. You can do a progressive time delay, which is the interval before the prompt gradually increases, or a constant time delay, where the interval before the prompt remains the same. So naturally, the next question typically for most folks is, what's the optimal time delay? And there's really no clear-cut consensus on what the optimal time delay is, but general rule of thumb is you can be begin with a two-second interval. And it's easier to see, I think it's easier to see a lot of these things than me trying to explain them. So I'm going to show a video of a progressive time delay. Show me cow. Good job, that's a cow. Show me eggs. Amazing, that's right, those are eggs. Show me fork. Fork. Show me lamp. Amazing, that's a lamp. Show me hot dog. This is a hot dog. Show me toothbrush. Great job, that's a toothbrush. Show me cupcake. Amazing, that's a cupcake. Show me elephant. Elephant. 
Show me hamburger. Perfect, that's a hamburger. Show me hairbrush. Show me horse. Awesome job, that's a horse. Show me fork. Way to go, that's a fork. Show me eggs. Amazing, those are eggs. Show me umbrella. Umbrella. Show me hot dog. Hot dog. Remember, if you don't know the answer, you can wait and I'll help you. Show me keys. Show me grapes. Grapes. Remember, if you don't know the answer, you can wait and I'll help you. Show me elephant. That's right, elephant. Show me hamburger. Great job, hamburger. Show me hairbrush. Show me ice cream. Awesome, that's ice cream. Show me hairbrush. Great, that's a hairbrush. Show me hot dog. Hot dog, remember if you don't know the answer, you can wait and I'll help you. Show me hamburger. Hamburger. Show me dog. You got it, that's a dog. Show me keys. Super, those are keys. Show me umbrella. Umbrella. Show me cow. You got it, that's a cow. Show me fork. That's correct, that's a fork. Show me milk. That's milk. Show me milk. Amazing, that's milk. Show me fork. Great job, that's a fork. Show me horse. Horse, remember if you don't know the answer, you can wait and I'll help you. Show me umbrella. Umbrella. Show me keys. Great job, those are keys. Show me elephant. Elephant. Show me hamburger. Way to go, that's a hamburger. Show me donut. Awesome, that's a donut. Show me pot. Pot. Remember, if you don't know the answer, you can wait and I'll help you. Show me grapes. That's right, way to go. Those are grapes.
Okay, so that was an example of a um, progressive time delay um, during a table session. So we're going to look at using prompts and to, trans and to transfer a student's control effectively. How do we do this? Um, one, you select an appropriate prompt strategy, fit prompt uh, to learner and task, select specific prompts, select prompt to guide behavior, gain learner's attention. Um, sometimes when we're doing the game, we, uh, sorry, let me back up. Uh, there are times when we get to, s we have to teach learning attention, how to gain learner's attention. We have to teach those behaviors before we can even get to the practice of the skill that we are working on. Then we present the discriminative stimulus, prompt the correct response, reinforce the di desired behavior, transfer stimulus control, and continue to uh, reinforce unprompted behaviors. Sorry, I'm looking through something. And I thought I had a fixed time delay in here, but I don't believe I do, so my apologies. Um, so what we want to talk about next is stimulus control maintenance and generalization. Um, this is something I'm, I really am into as far as my research and my work is generalization practices and maintenance practices. It is something that I think we as a field do very poorly. And when I speak, when I say we as a field, I'm talking about um, professors in behavior analysis and special education as well uh, that are doing research and that are preparing the next generation of behavior analysts and, and, and people that work with individuals with disabilities. I think we do a poor job of training you all to focus on generalization and maintenance. Um, and that is a problem. Uh, Stokes and Bear in 1977 have an, conduct, wrote an article called um, an implicit technology for generalization, which um, outlines how to do generalization and maintenance. Um, it was it's been it was talked about then. Um, she learned colleagues in the 2000s. I'm spacing on the dates. I want to say 2007 or eight, but I I don't recall off the top of my head. Uh, looked at how do we generalize teaching behaviors in special education? And then Markel's Ryden and Sheeler um, also looked at this, at uh, how professors at universities are teaching individuals to generalize. Um, and we found that it is very bad <laughs> um, when we did our research article on it. But it's really important um, to program for generalization and maintenance um, at the jump before we even start doing interventions. And that's, I think, where there's a problem, right? I think, and I've witnessed, I'm not just like saying this anecdotally, that generalization and maintenance are an afterthought and we do them at the end. Um, researchers and practitioners, we do these things as an add-on towards the end and it should be something that's focused on from the beginning. There are a couple ways to look at generalization and maintenance. Stimulus generalization, response generalization, and uh, response maintenance. And we're going to look at these um, individually. Uh, so when we talk about stimulus generalization, it's the expansion of a student's capability of performance beyond those conditions set forth in, uh, for initial acquisition. Exhibition of behavior in the presence of all relevant SD outside the training situation. And to put it just bluntly or generically, can this student or learner perform under conditions different than those in a training where those skills were taught or where they were trained? Um, so an example of this, and it, this is one of my favorite examples ever because it, it, it hit me in the feels, essentially, as they say. Um, so when I was a special education teacher in Colorado, I worked in the Vail Valley near Vail Ski Resort. I lived actually directly across from Beaver Creek Ski Resort, which was amazing. And when I arrived in Colorado, they had, had asked me if I'd be interested in doing this thing called SOS at the time. SOS stood for Snowboard Outreach, um, Snowboard Outreach Society, I believe it was. And what the SOS did is that they identified through school records and, and things like that, uh, students from low SES backgrounds, students that had 
um, office referrals, uh, students that were struggling academically, and we had these lessons that we would do before school started, um, like right before homeroom, we would do them all right after, um, yeah, we know, I'm sorry, yeah, we do them right before the bell uh, for homeroom. Really short uh, lessons that focus on courage, discipline, integrity, wisdom, compassion, and humility. And if students came to the lessons every day, they earned their free ticket, essentially. And it was free to them. We would go from our school, Gypsum Creek, um, in Colorado, and a, a bus would take us up, the public bus would take us up to Vail. The only cost of the students was the three dollars that it cost to ride up and back. So it was a buck fifty up and a buck fifty back um, to ride the bus to Vail. Uh, they got free lift tickets, free lessons, free equipment rental. Uh, uh, they also had to bring money for food or bring a lunch. But if any of you are skiers or snowboarders or, or mountain folks, uh, you know that a day on a on a, a just a lift ticket to Vail is two hundred dollars. Just a lift ticket. That doesn't mean. Uh, is it? It's up there. It's like 150. It's something absurd how much they're charging now. But then you add rentals and all that stuff. Regardless, they did all these things. They got that stuff for free, which is great for them because this is something that not many of them, even though they lived in the Vail Valley, got to do. Um, and we had been teaching uh, that week's lesson was um, compassion. And like I said, these were some kids that had not had these experiences and they would go off with their lessons with the instructors. I'd go take a couple hot laps and then come back and then ride with them and then go take a couple laps and go ride with them. And then we'd all meet up for lunch. So I'm sitting at the, the one lodge where we'd all meet up for lunch and I'm sitting on the deck waiting for my students to get there. And I see this little girl who's not part of our crew, uh, just like dragging her skis and her hat's all a mess and helmet's all off to the side and her poles are falling down and she just fell and dropped all her stuff, which was very sad, right? It was super sad. But what I saw was two of my students come like running from out of nowhere, it seemed, and help pick her up and dust her, the snow off of her, gave, picked up her stuff, gave her her equipment, helped and actually helped carry some of her equipment over to where she was heading to, to where her uh, family was. And like, I'm standing on like the, balcony like trying not to like scream like yeah because i was so stoked on what they were doing but what what happened was that they generalized the behaviors and stuff that we talked about during the lessons at school and they took them to in the training setting they took them to the natural setting which was just so cool so um that's what we want to see when we're doing work with people and when we're training new skills is that that they learn them in one setting and then they use them somewhere else and that's the point if we only train students to do or learners or students to do things in one place well, what the hell is the point right because we need to be teaching them to be doing these things in different places and if we're not doing that we've failed as behavior analysts uh, there's also response generalization so that was that's uh let me go back so that was stimulus generalization. So response generalization is changes in behavior similar to those directly treated. Um, it occurs when behaviors change that were not specifically targeted in the original intervention program. Uh, so an example, I had a student that loved biting. He was a pincher as well, but I could deal with that. Um, I just, I can't stand being bit. It's not pleasant, it's not fun. Um, so I put a reinforcement schedule in that reduced the biting. Um, what was cool though, and what was great is that the program that we used to reduce the biting was uh, we had this, it also reduced his pinching behavior. So it, the response is generalized to other behaviors and both um, aggressive behaviors reduced, which is fantastic if you can get that. Our response maintenance, the occurrence of behavior over time. It's what it is essentially is when we withdraw the intervention, we remove the intervention, the trained or, or the trained skill or behavior continues to occur without support. And again, that's what we should be doing. That's what we want to occur. That's what we want our learners to be doing. If we always have to provide um, contrived reinforcement schedules for individuals, we're not 
doing them justice and we need to get them to these natural uh, maintaining contingencies. Uh, maintenance, maintenance improves when the skill is taught to mastery, rehearsed, rehearsed and practiced. There are eight strategies for promoting generalization and these are things that need to be thought about at the jump again like when before we start putting in behavior intervention plans we need to consider consider how are we focusing on how are we focusing on generalization so the considerations for target generalizable behaviors uh, teach skills that are socially valid so not only are they socially valid for the individual, they will also be recognized and reinforced out in the natural setting. Teach a range of functional equivalent behaviors instead of hitting, yelling, crying to escape a task. Teach a student to raise hand, ask for help, ask for a different task. We've talked about functionally equivalent behaviors. Uh, incorporate valid, valid, relevant stimuli in the training setting. So make sure that that's, the approaches that we're using in the training setting mimic uh, or are valid or relevant. That they actually mean something to the learner. Incorporate common stimuli. So stimuli that they will encounter, uh, common stimuli they will encounter in the natural setting. And use indiscriminate contingencies. So um, we wanna think about using those variable schedules where the contingencies are not so predictable. Reinforce occurrences of generalization of the target behavior. So when we're seeing students generalize their behaviors in different settings, uh, we need to provide that reinforcement. And one way we can do that is by recruiting relevant stakeholders to engage in that reinforcement of generalized target behaviors outside of the training setting. Encourage natural contingencies of reinforcement and discourage natural uh, punishment contingencies, and incorporate learner-generated mediator mediators of generalization. And what those are, are stimuli maintained and transported by the learner as part of training. Um, some examples of this and things that I have done research on are uh, behavior contracts, daily behavior report cards, and uh, self-monitoring, uh, self-reinforcing, self-checklists, and things like that that they can take with them from the training setting and take them out to the natural setting and um, use them to generalize behavior. Um, something else we need to consider here are, uh, is caregiver and staff training. So uh, upon becoming a BCBA, there are several things that we need to be doing outside of just delivering services to individuals. Um, for some folks, once you become a full, um, full blown BCBA, um, you may not be providing as much one-on-one -on -one services to and treatment to individuals. Uh, you may be working, uh, you may be supervising teams. You might end up running your own clinic. And we have a lot of things that we need to consider. It's not all just um, providing direct services. Um, adequate caregiver and staff training is critical for overall success for our learners. We need to make sure that not only are we providing solid training to our staff that are working underneath us um, and with us. I hate the, and I shouldn't use the term underneath us because I really don't look at people that way. Um, I look at us as a team, but with teams, there's always a leader, a person in charge. And as a BCBA, often you'll be in that position of quote power. Um, and with that power becomes responsibility to train your staff well and have clearly laid out protocols for how things are done. And that falls on you um, as a BCBA. You are responsible and you need to train your staff on how to do interventions, how to collect data, how to make the decisions, database decisions, um, how to log their hours, all of that stuff and more um, and on you to do that but also we have to understand that we need to train caregivers um, most of the time um, you will run into caregivers who are not versed in behavior analysis who don't have um, 
behavioral training don't understand basic principles of behavior and that's not their fault it doesn't make them dumb it doesn't make them incompetent it just means that they didn't study this stuff and it is up to us to train caregivers um, how to continue continually run interventions at home when we're not there how to provide reinforcement for the desired behaviors to encourage that generalization and that maintenance of behavior and to help strengthen those behaviors in a learner's repertoire and it's really on us as bcbas to provide good caregiver training uh, we're not going to get into how to do that it does in the book a bit but it's about how do we develop these trainings and we have to explicitly teach them we have to use modeling we have to use prompting we have to check for understanding we have to use reinforcement with caregivers so a lot of things to consider when we're doing caregiver training parent training uh, both caregivers and staff can be trained via behavior skills training entry-level behavior technicians will not play a large role in training others uh, but may participate by collecting data and role playing um, so we might have RBTs that are with us and they may not be doing the caregiver training, but they can be there as part of the team supporting us, helping with data collection, help with role playing, help with checks for understanding and monitoring and doing active participant responding um, and things like that. Like RBTs are just as important as a BCB, BCABA and just as important as a BCBA. We're all on the same team trying to do things, trying to do good things for people. Um, I'm not a big fan of thinking, oh, hey, look at me, Mr. PhD, BCBA. I'm way smarter and cooler than you, um, little RBT. That's not the way I operate. Yes, there are people out there like that, but I think they're stupid. Um, and if you're one of those people that are doing that, stop doing that. Don't be stupid. Uh, as behavior techs gain experience, they may start taking on a little bit more, respons more responsibility in those trainings. Um, so doing some modeling, as I mentioned, for uh, and training caregivers and staff while under the supervision of a, BCA, a BCBA. Being a professional, I take so I mean we've been together now for seven weeks. Yeah, um, some of us, you, some of you have me in other classes. I think you can kind of pick up on my style. I'm more laid back. Um, you know, I'm a fan of treating everybody like they're adults and like you do your stuff. You'll be fine. If you don't, natural contingency, no points for you. Um, I don't really harp on people. I don't badger people. That's not my style. Um, but one thing I do take, like, so at the beginning of this, I told you about, like, the plagiarism and broad, plagiarism and broad thing. Like, I take that very seriously. I also take being a professional very seriously. Um, I just do it with my style. But um, when you're writing documentation, when you're making documentation, when you're writing reports use professional language um, really practice that I, I can't emphasize that enough when you're doing assignments for uwf practice writing with professional language and i will commend you all do a great job with this um, but really think about how you communicate um, while being while you're a student here at uwf because what you're doing is you're practicing this professional language and and that doesn't just mean in your feas and behavior intervention plan but i'm talking about emails assignments discussions start honing that skill of using professional language in your reports and i'll tell you uh, a story so when i was a student uh taking behavior analytic coursework to sit for the exam i was taking an assessment course and we were doing FBAs and FAs, and I um, was writing up an FBA. And I was in a I was in a home setting, working with a student with autism in a home setting, and um, the family was great. The kids were great, um, but the family was a little um, unorganized and. I used the term disheveled in my report. And I didn't, when I wrote it, um, I wasn't trying to, um, it wasn't a dig at the family. I wasn't trying to be mean or rude. I was just describing what I observed. And my instructor, um, 
at the time, uh, Dana Gardner, she was reading it and providing feedback to me on my assignment and just mentioned like, hey man, like you have to understand that like the parents and stuff will probably read this report and you want to um, carefully choose how you describe stuff. And it really just, it was a, a very important learning opportunity for me to be like, damn, like I need to think about that stuff. And again, I wasn't trying to be rude or mean. Um, I was just describing it as I saw it, but I could have, you know, approached it differently. And I think that's important. So just considering how we're writing stuff, using professional language in all our documentation and reports, because we're up for audits by insurance companies, government might do an audit. Um, uh, families see these documents, other behavior analysts potentially see these documents. So we just need to hold ourselves to a high standard. Remain objective. It's very tough. I thought I am fallible, if you will. We all make mistakes. Um, but when we are guided by data and we stick to being objective, we um, can remove a lot of error just by following the data and being objective. Um, be a good teammate and a leader. Uh, and this includes talking with parents. Um, there are a, couple, a bunch of different types of parents. There are, there's the term helicopter parent where the parents are always there. Uh, parents who people perceive as being absent. Um, we never know what parents are dealing with. Um, you know, when we're providing services to individuals with disabilities, we have our time with them and then they go on their merry way and we go on ours. Um, this is a reality for many families, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, no breaks. Um, some families, the caregivers or guardians or parents are working multiple jobs. Just because they're not responding all the time doesn't mean they don't care. And I think that's a connection many people make. Uh, oh, I tried to get a hold of these parents or we're trying to do these behavior intervention plans, we're trying to do these programs, and the parents aren't following through. They must not care. Well, that's not true. Uh, maybe in some instances, I'm not saying it's not, it's not global. Um, I am doing a bit of overgeneralizing. Um, but we have to understand that everybody has their things. Um, I'm a parent. I'm a parent of a, a two and a half year old daughter. She has a genetic disease called hyperinsulinemia. Um, essentially what it is, is the, it's the opposite of diabetes where um, her body creates too much insulin, which creates drastically low blood sugars. And if we don't keep it under control, she um, has seizures. And that can be very, A, it is very scary. And B, uh, that can be very harmful to her developmentally. Um, so I try to be very responsive in my emails. I try to continue to be very professional. I try to keep an open dialogue and communication. But if something's going on with my daughter and she needs me, like I'll jump off this Zoom in a heartbeat. And y'all might not understand um, as far because you don't, if I didn't tell you the background, like you wouldn't know. Um, or if I don't respond because there's an emergency, that's why. And sometimes we don't think of those things. And, um, and the only reason I bring up Nora, my daughter, about that is because, you know, before that, like, it really helped me. Yeah, I, I, before, A, before being a parent, you know, you know these things, but, you know, it became my reality. Um, and it's something I need to practice. Like, you just never know what someone else is going through. So um, being a good teammate is part of, um, understanding what other people are going through, what you're, if you are running the show, what your employees are going through. If you are an employee, what just uh, being a good person, like essentially don't be a jerk um, and be considerate of other people and what's happening and uh, all of those things. Be aware of state and federal laws and this stuff changes often. So you need to be you need to check the. You need to be continually monitoring the pulse of state and federal laws in regard to ABA and providing services. Uh, that might include getting on listservs, governmental websites, uh, social media, reliable social media groups. 
that are tuned into those kind of things. Getting involved with your state level ABA communities as well as your uh, national uh, ABA communities is very also very important and helpful when it comes to the changes in laws. Understand that you're a mandated reporter um, and what all that means and you know that we are charged with ensuring safety of the individuals that we care for and provide treatment to and that if we suspect some uh, type of abuse or neglect or something like that is happening we are a mandated reporter and we need to report that to the proper authorities uh, when there are bites aggressive behaviors uh, whatever injuries etc we need to write incident reports when needed and write them with detail dated all those things confidentiality at all times including data storage we um we need to um continually think about confidentiality there are not many jobs where you are always on if you will but as a behavior analyst as an educator like you are never not a behavior analyst once you are a behavior analyst when you are a behavior analyst from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed and what I mean by that is uh, you can be at the grocery store and you're still behavior analyst then, right? If you're at the movies, you're still behavior analyst then. If you're at the park, you're still the behavior analyst. Like wherever you go, you're behavior analyst you. Uh, it doesn't turn off, even if you're not doing the job. And you never know who is, let's say you're when, restaurants are open and, and hopefully there's a vaccine for what we're all going through this COVID stuff and um, hopefully you know it all turns around but you never know who is in the booth behind you at the restaurant who is sitting beside you on the bar or who is sitting beside you at the at the bar um, on the stool beside you as you're talking about um, and you might be sitting there with peers during happy hour or whatever, talking about a client and the bartender or the person sitting beside you or behind you is their mother, dad, brother, sister, uncle, cousin, next door neighbor, all of those things, right? Like any of those things. Um, you never know if you're a server, you never like who might be related to the people we're working with. And it's okay to talk about your work. And it's okay to talk about issues that you're having with certain people, certain clients. But what is not okay is to use their name and break confidentiality. Uh, we work in a very small field. Like, yeah, there are a lot of us, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, it is a very small field. And in your region, wherever all of you are, right, you're all spread out all over the place. But um, in your region, like, there might not be a ton of behavior analysts. So, it wouldn't take someone a ton of sleuthing, if you will, to figure out who you're talking about. Um, so it's really just important to monitor yourselves continuously about confidentiality. Like I'm kicking myself right now because when I was telling the story about um, my snowboarding uh, thing, I used the name of the school that I taught at. Like I try to do a good job, things, it slips. Um, you have to be very careful. Uh, you have to be cautious. You have to continually monitor yourself. Um, and not only is that about just your verbal behavior, but that comes with um, your hard um, permanent products, your data stuff. Uh, really be cognizant of where your files are, how you're locking them up at night, where you're storing them, where you're keeping them. Um, a pro tip for you all, do not leave files, laptops, iPads, or anything in your vehicles. Like, don't leave them in there. I know it's a pain in the ass to take your, you know, messenger bag or whatever you carry your stuff in into the store with you, or if you're stopping to get groceries on the way home from work or whatever it is, but 
if your car is stolen or broken into or whatever it is and and someone takes a bag right like if someone walks past my car and i didn't have my messenger bag it's a leather messenger bag it has my laptop and my files and stuff in it if someone walked through smashed the window just grabbed that and ran like there goes confidentiality like all that data is out there um and the way I like to think about this and kind of the connection that I make is if I were sitting at the bar and I heard someone say my name, like at a table behind me and they're talking about, let's say it's my doctor, let's say, and I, I'm in for my yearly physical and I hear this doctor talking about how terribly, terrible Ben's health is. Like that's, in, that's awful. Like that would, I would feel violated. I would feel embarrassed. It would, I'd be pissed. Like there'll be so many emotions and like no one wants that to happen to them. So we have to do a good job as behavior analysts to protect the confidentiality of the people that we, uh, that we are trying to help. Uh, know the code, be the code. Know about ethics, know the ethical guidelines, read that sucker, take it to heart. If something's questionable, if you're, if you're thinking that something might be unethical, Odds are it's not. It's not ethical. Um, if you have to question yourself, um, really consider what's going on. Take a moment. Take a breath. Confide in people that you trust, and then move forward. Client dignity, the golden rule, man. Like treat others how you want them to treat your treat you. Like just be a good person. Um, we look in, at society and we look at the media, social media, the news, um, and there's just so much turbulence in the world. Um, and a lot of it revolves around like, I don't like you because of your religion or, or your choice in religion. I don't like you because of the color of your skin. I don't like you because of where you come from. I don't like you because you're old. I don't like you because you're young. I don't like you because you have a disability. Like all this stuff is just around us all the time. And it doesn't have to be that way. It's, um, it's unfortunate, it's not even the strongest word. It's awful, sad that things are that way. But what we can do is in the community, communities that we are in, that we run in, that we work in, that we build. Treat people with dignity and respect. Um, and that can go a long way, but when we're working with our clients, like respect their dignity, treat them like you would want to be treated. And monitor yourself for stress and burnout. This is a hard field, man. It's tough. It's grueling at times it's incredibly rewarding um, and it's exhausting and you'll hear people out there bragging about how much they work like it's some badge of honor to be like i worked 80 hours this week well you're dumb don't work 80 hours for those of you that have worked 80 hours i've been there too it was dumb i shouldn't have done that um you need to find positive ways to engage in self-care and plan that stuff and like put it in the calendar like when i was going through my doctoral program it was really challenging and i had to put in a lot of work uh, hours at work and in the office and like i scheduled like dates with my wife like we're going to go to the movies we're going to go do this and we're going to like i put them in my calendar i know that sounds funny i know that sounds silly but like every Friday night, like we go out for beers and food. This is before my daughter uh, was born. And we would go to concerts if they were in town. Like make that stuff a priority in your life. Uh, find positive outlets. Meditation, yoga, riding your bicycle, going for a walk, watching football, watching golf, watching my wife and I, I should just throw her under the bus. We both watch crappy reality TV. Um, whatever it is, you know, going to the beach, whatever your thing is, like take that, embrace it, and don't be ashamed by that. 
because taking care of yourself will allow you to take care of others and will reduce that stress and burnout. That's where there's a high attrition rate in our field where people will even fail because of being burnt out. And if we're going to combat, combat that, um, we really need to take it, take, be mindful of our own health and our own mental health. Um, someone that does a lot of work in that type of field of self care is Shane Spiker. Uh, does some really great stuff so you can check him out um, online. Um, if you're on Twitter, he has a handle on there. I forget what it is off the top of my head, but he does a lot of self care stuff and it's really cool stuff. But just, yeah, Shane Spiker, take really good care of yourself, be mindful, and don't be ashamed about that. Um, learn how to say no. Don't say no all the time. No one likes that. No one wants to work with the person that says no all the time. But if you have too much to do and someone uh, talks about that, or uh, if someone asks you to do something, you're not capable of doing it, say no. And it's okay. Um, so just know that you need to take care of yourself uh, at the same time. And then the last thing I have for you all is our final lecture verification. Um, lecture verification number two is, ah. Oh, I hate goodbyes. Um, I want to thank you all for a really awesome semester. It's been great. Um, I really enjoyed working with you all. Um, so that's all we have tonight. So that's it.